Hi everyone, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. And with us today, we have Ian Callum. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sam. Welcome. Can you tell the audience a little bit about just a sort of short summary of who you are and what you do if if they've not come across you before? Yes. um, As you say, my name is Ian Callum. I've been a car designer for 40 years uh, professionally. And before that, I was a car designer. wanting to be car designer <laughs> from a very, very young age, probably the age of three or four years old, actually. So uh, it goes back a long way. Um, I've worked at Ford Motor Company. I've worked at TWR, Tom Walkershaw Racing. And the last 20 years of my life, well, prior to retiring, um, was at Jaguar, Jaguar Cars in, in Coventry. I've been retired now, effectively. Well, I left work three years ago to start my own design business called Callum. So not it. not quite retired then. Still still <laughs> not still quite going. Retired. No, it's um I sometimes wonder why, but uh you know, but I think I think about designers like any creatives, they don't really want to stop. You got to keep going. Mm. And you have to keep proving to yourself that uh, you can still do it. Um you know, like old rock stars, I suppose, they just keep going until they fall over, you know. <laughs> So, uh, and I guess, awesome. like from the, uh, you said from the early days, you know, you were always, you like designing cars, even as like a kid. Um, is that, is it, has the sort of the design part been the bit that's the most sort of overall interests you, or is automotive and then it's some weird blend of the two? No, I think I've, I've, I've often asked myself this, and if I'm honest, it's the design part, it's the whole process of design. I actually, started off drawing things around the house when I was very young. So before I even had any notion of motor cars, that came a little bit later. Um, um, and when I went to college and, and art school in Glasgow, I did I did um, industrial design, product design. So I was designing lots of things other than cars. I was, I was fortunate I was allowed to design a few cars while I was there or car type products. Mm. Um, but it's, it's a process of design that satisfies me most. But unfortunately, in many ways, I also have a passion for cars, separately. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of old cars, and I love the whole notion of a motor car as it is today, although it's probably going to change over the next few years. But um, it's something that means a lot to me, and it's given me a lot of pleasure uh, in life. So mm. bringing the two together has, has been ideal, really. Yeah. And from that, when you start you know, doing product design and then – moving on to designing cars i imagine cars are generally probably more complex than most products yeah although i'm sure there's some some other stuff is that how do you sort of start bridging that gap of i don't i don't know what you were designing initially but it it could be something like you know something that goes on your table or whatever and then something as crazily complex as a car the, the the process is really just first of all it's just about the big picture you know you start off drawing cars as as a full entity, you know, mm. car shape on wheels. And um, when I was younger, I probably emulated a few cars that I saw out there. I wasn't in a, so much of a creative mode. I was a, a bit of a copycat mode and, you know, I was drawing stuff around me. So it's a process of drawing that I probably learned first. And it's quite an important process because the form of communication. But once I realized I could draw, I could create. Because mm. I'm just telling you what to draw, how to draw. So yeah, the, whole, yeah, yeah. The, whole, the whole notion of creativity came into play. And then I realized, of course, I could design my own cars. And, you know, at that point decided that's what I would do one day in a rather naive, optimistic way. <laughs> and and it, it just came about through the whole process of drawing. I think the process of, of uh, industrial design teaches you problem solving. Like any good creative, whether it be an engineer or a designer or a songwriter, or whatever they might be, it, it's about problem solving. It's about finding the answer to the question you're asking. And of course, first of all, you need to know the question you're asking because that's where a lot of people get confused and they, they end up with sort of random designs because they haven't really gone in there with a, an objective of trying to resolve something. That, that resolution might be a practical resolution. It might be an aesthetic resolution. It might be how do you make forms work over certain packages. Uh, but ideally, it's probably a matter of a, a case of, of, of both, really. It's about practicality and aesthetic. And car design really is all about that. Hmm. 
And that that bit of defining the question and the sort of overall thing of it, do, is that quite a... Do you delve into that heavily at the beginning, I guess, for quite a period of time? Yes, I do, because, you know, in professional life, you're usually told what the question is. And then my first point is to question the question. You know, I, I, I go into the, the, the brief and really try and understand what is the brief trying to resolve. If somebody says to me, design a five-seater saloon car to replace the F-type, not the, sorry, the, yeah. F, the X-type, for instance, you know, I would say, well, is that really what you want to do? Or do you want to create something that's quite new? And that's what happened when I did the I-PACE. So, you know, it's really about questioning the question and questioning objectives. Because when you get a set of objectives, you get a set of attributes thrown at you. And these attributes are really stem from facts that we know today. Right. A designer's job is really to question those facts. Are these the only facts or do they really matter? And then, and then I also say that when you apply yourself to, to designing something, I said this in my professional work all the time, to my, to my superiors, to the board, you know, really, you have to really work hard to work out where your priorities are. Because when you work in a car business, they have this set of attributes that come at you. And everybody puts their attributes at the top of the list. Well, you can't be <laughs> yeah. everything to all men. That's just a fact of life. Design is about putting that into a sense of order and working out where the priorities are and where the lesser things should be. And in a corporate business, that's a very difficult thing for people to do. But that's what yeah. a designer has to do. I'll give you an example. If you can design an F-type Jaguar, you design a two-seater sports car with enough power to be enjoyable and, and wrap everything around that for two people. That's that's the objective. There shouldn't be other yeah. objectives involved. Designing a transit van, you're designing something to carry so much capacity. And therefore, yeah. the shape and design of it is determined by something. I know it's a very obvious thing to say, but you'd be surprised how confused people get about these things. You know, yeah. but bits in the middle that are not so obvious, it becomes quite quite an interesting discussion, let's say. So, um, yeah, it's about really understanding what the objective is and what you're trying to resolve. Yeah, and you can see it. You can see it in products that come out and you go like, yeah, but like, what exactly are you trying to do? Like, at the moment, we see, we seem to have a lot of vehicles that are kind of SUV, half carrying people, but don't necessarily have more space in them. And then you kind of wonder, I wonder like, you know, what is that? Have they been designed with a purely a purpose or is it just everyone's chucking their thing in and there's some marketing and sales and. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of marketing speak in these things. And it's always something that I looked at with a, a, bit, a little bit of skepticism because they're, 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 on the whole, based on something that's happened in the past. If, if somebody does a, a, an SUV, it's clearly a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sports utility vehicle. It has objectives that you should understand. It should be able to go off-road to a certain extent. It should be able to carry five people in, in comfort, but also with a certain um, seat posture, which is quite high up. And that's mm. what people actually like in these cars. But they become too expensive, so they start creating something called a crossover, which is really a car which is built up slightly higher in order to meet that aspect of it. Does it meet all the aspects of an SUV? No, it doesn't. And so it's kind of between the two because they can't decide whether they do a car or whether they do an SUV. And it may well be that cost is, and the pricing is, is the determining factor there. And so you get this sort of enormous range of vehicles that are stemmed from various different objectives. Mm. And really not one of them is, is taking a priority. But that's fine. It, if, if, if at the end of the day it's what people are happy to buy and want, yeah. then um, then then it works for the from a commercial means. It works. Crossover is an interesting thing because they are derived from SUVs. Are not really SUVs, and they are derived from the notion that people want to sit higher in their car, and and, and feel a little bit safer because they're sitting higher. Um, but also, they're just a cheap version of SUVs. Yeah, it's a. It's an interesting one, and I, and I know like a lot of my friends, they, or people I know, they'll get in a car and they they really like their high up driving position. I'm like, okay, but have you ever sat in a normal car and actually just raised your seat? And they're like, oh, hang on a minute, I can see because a lot a lot of it is like my wife or other other ladies, and they can't see over the steering wheel. You know, they they're like they're so s s sat so deep in the car that um, 
and it just doesn't work. But, there's, an um, option. there's always an option. Yeah, yeah. There's always an option, exactly. How do you feel about when you've got designing for what the, you hear a lot about, but it's what sort of customers want or what customers are looking for and designing for design purpose first, customers will come second or customers want this, therefore we design it. How do you feel about that kind of well, I, of course, we when we were in the car industry, and that's my only reference really is what we did over the last forty years. I was involved in a lot of um, customer studies and and concept group and study groups with with mm. and On the whole, I didn't really find them um, hugely helpful because you, what you find out very quickly is people don't know what they want until they see it. <laughs> yeah, right? and so um, yeah, it's normal, you know, if if. And I'm sure Johnny Ive in designing the iPhone wasn't listening to he was listening to a lot of customers how they wanted things to work, but certainly not how it looked and how it would probably operate at the end of the day. So, you know, if you create something that is better than the last thing without asking customers, I'm sure they will they will come to you anyway. So I'm I will listen to I would always listen to customers what they want, but they don't really know what they want until the next new yeah. thing comes along and they'll want that. I mean, if you ask somebody um twenty years ago, what would they want in a phone? They'd say a cordless phone. They wouldn't say an iPhone, yeah. would they? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a very complicated um, set of questions you need to ask somebody to really get to what they want. However, having said that, I think and be, because we haven't asked so many questions with some of this modern technology, things do tend to get overly complicated. Mm. And now we're offering customers things they don't actually want or need. In, in, in one product because they're accessible through some other means of, of electronics. And yeah. a car is like that. You know, if you, if you take a modern motor car, it's, it's, it's capable of so much more than your average customer actually needs in both communication and ability. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a bar to get to and everybody tries to reach that level. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find, how, designing a, a variety of cars over your career? Um, I was looking looking back at sort of some of the things. Um, one of the one you were involved in, I don't know to what extent, was the Nissan um, LMGT1. Was it R390? Yes, yes. Was, <laughs> yeah, well, that was a that was a weird one. Um, I was very fortunate in that during my time at Ford and also at TWR, I learned a lot about aerodynamics and from from both sides, from both downforce and efficiency, and they're two quite distinct different um distinctly different objectives um so i had some way of understanding what the aerodynamics of a race car should be i wasn't a super expert there were other people to do that but what happened there was that the um the car had to be in the spirit of a, a road car and it had to be homologated as a road car and of course having designed a number of road cars i knew what homologation meant in terms yeah. of legislation it's quite complicated and so um, Tom Walkinshaw gave me the job of designing the body for it for two reasons. He wanted something that would meet all the, the, the road regulations so he can get it homologated clearly. And also he wanted something that was in the spirit of a road car that you looked like you could get into and drive, as albeit maybe a supercar, but at least it didn't look like an all all like race car, mm. which is really quite divorced from your normal road cars. I mean, there are areas where they blend together clearly, but he wanted this car to look like a bona fide supercar road car and so he asked me to design the body and and the, the shape of it almost in entirety and i worked with the aerodynamic people to make sure we got the aero right which i think were pretty pretty good but the end result was something you could put in a showroom because it yeah. was, because in this case it was about the aesthetic it did matter to him that it looked like a, a customer car you can go and buy yeah unfortunately we only made two but um, yeah it was, it was quite a cool thing. And how was, presumably back then, so this was 1997, eight, something like Seven, that. Yeah, uh, late 90s, yeah. Um, the, the tech that you, the tools in your toolbox have evolved significantly from them. Has your sort of process evolved as well along with some big changes? Yeah, the process of getting from idea to reality has changed um, considerably. And, and, and the great advantage it gives you is speed mm. and an opportunity for different ideas without having to focus on one or two ideas because you only have time to do that. 
And, you know, we go into a digital world very quickly now and we create things digitally to a point that aesthetically you can make a lot of judgment from them. I mean, there's a time we're going through that period when we were learning and they're kind of late 90s we're just discovering this and i was never i was a little bit cynical about it naturally but um i was never confident you can make judgment on digital models just looking at mm. them but nowadays i'm absolutely confident we can make a lot more judgment on them and so we can create these digital models to all intents and purposes they are full 3d models that might as well exist there's enough yeah. information there just to to to, to build them um, but at the end of the day, I still insist on, on creating probably a clay model or a, a full size verification model. I, I, yeah. I still wouldn't have the, the 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 courage to go and produce an idea from digital into millions Production. of pounds of tooling. Yeah, um, some designers say they might, but I tell you this thing: um, no matter what people say around the world, oh, we're fully digital, we're fully digital, they're not. You know, they're not fully digital. They might do a lot more work digitally, but in reality, there's still a clay model lurking away in the background, getting yeah. defined by touch and feel and, and 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 visually and walking around it and absorbing it. Because a, a motor car is a big thing. You yeah. know, it's not the size of an iPhone or a or a tele changer or something like that. It's not something you can just look at from a few a few inches. It's something you have to see as a totality from two hundred yards away. Yeah, hundred meters away. So, you know, it's a big thing to take in, and you have to be able to 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 absorb it as a full entity in in, in its real space. So, to that end, I still insist upon working uh, finally with a, with a with a model that can be changed. Yeah, it's I, I find it, as humans we like, this amazing ability with like our eyes and our hands to see stuff that like you just when you look at it in terms of how out something is or a line, etc., cetera, like I'm, you will look at a car and go, okay, hang on, we need to change this. But you have to see it and touch it versus a little, you, in terms of that final bit, right? Or you, not. you do. And I, I'm sure I always equate our, our work to, to songwriters. They're probably the same. You know, there's a, there's a note slight like a cue there. So you need to go and adjust these notes or the way they relate to each other or, or layers of, of, um, of music that have to run together um and so yeah you have to you have to be part of it physically and i think this need to be part of things physical will come back to us as a as a race you know we're going into almost a a, a meta world to use a phrase yeah. um, you know into this sort of strange world of digital make-believe but uh you know the crafts are coming back people want to see and feel things that are made by humans and and you can touch and feel them and and this whole process, I think, is the same. I think people want to be part of it physically, not just digitally. Yeah. But, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's an endless discussion, really. You know, you, you talk to another designer who might be a bit younger than me who could totally disagree. I say, no, I'm quite happy to have the digital world. And the first thing we see is a, a product that suddenly appears on the road first time. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one. Do you surround yourself with sort of nice bits of design that you can like touch and feel at home um do you know we're not really i mean i'm looking around i suppose i've got a couple of nice things on the uh on, on the, the the music side of things because i like listening to music and you know i've got bars and books and stuff and i've got um um a couple of nice pieces of of technical stuff in terms of music but do you know what i don't really I'm quite austere in my uh, in my surroundings, and that gets back to my sense for you know minimalism. And you find as you get older, the less things you actually want around you, you know, except perhaps fresh air and sunlight. Um, but uh, no, I've got a nice watch. Um, my cars are important to me, obviously. I've got a nice house which I designed myself. So yes, yeah, there's an answer there. Uh, Although I'm already at a stage that I want to go and do another one because this one <laughs> wasn't designed well enough. <laughs> um, in terms of artifacts, you know, pictures, yeah, on the wall, very important. Um, but I don't buy things purely to, to have aesthetics around me, no. I'm not quite William Morris on that front. With the things like you say, you know, your house, you've done it and then you're like, ah, okay, I would like to change it a little bit. Do you look back at, older projects and go 
oh, I would have done this or, oh, I've changed that now. And is that a constant sort of slight thing or are you trying to just move forwards? Yes, always. Always, you know, you look back at what you've done, but you've got to stop at some point and move on. And when you stop, you've got to feel pretty satisfied with what you've done. And you might yeah. feel 99 cents satisfied, but you know you're going to come back 10 years later and think, mm, really? You know, that could have been a bit better. But also what happens is visual aesthetics change. Time changes things. You know, your own outlook changes things. So it's not just a case of whether it's right or wrong. It's a case of how time moves aesthetics on. And, yeah. um, and, and therefore you leave those things of an era behind. Um, but sometimes they're, they're part. If you look at an E-type, for instance, it's perfect. It's of an era, though. It's definitely not yeah. 2022 car. It's of an era. Um, so, but you, I can accept that. It's far enough away now just to be accepted for what it is. Yeah. They did change it and messed it up, by the way. So, they would have it <laughs> as it was. Yeah, that is a, that is, it must be a, a difficult one. How do you, as a designer, do you think, because I look at different aesthetics and some cars come out and I go, okay, maybe in five years' time, I think that will look great, but now I'm not sure. And then I've seen it happen where things look better in the future. Um, one that I look back now, I think 12C. I quite like the design of the 12C now. Didn't particularly like it when it came came out. But do you think your sort of brain is 10 years ahead of current, of just general pop? Or is it sort of, how do, how do you sort of place that? Well, the, the the way I place it now, it, it, that's a very difficult thing. I mean, there's, there's a number of things there. I look at some cars now and think they're wrong. And I know they're still going to be wrong in 10 years' time. You know, <laughs> and, they, and they make me cringe. And I just think, guys, what are you doing? But there are other cars that I actually come out and think, well, you know, that's that's quite, quite obtuse or quite aggressive. But I could see that working in a while, you know, because things in your eyes mellow. I mean... Yeah. The Audi Grill, for instance, you know, we looked at the first Audi Grills, thought, whoa, whoa. But you see them now, your eyes grow accustomed to that yep. mass. And, and and so they get bigger and bigger until somebody says stop. And BMW is doing something similar now as well with the grills. You know, they're really testing the aesthetic. Uh, it, it looks challenging at the moment. Will it look challenging in five years? I'll be honest with you on that one. The, um, I'm not very sure. I think they'll be fine. I think there are other things in the cars that will not be fine, mind you. But... Uh, but I think the grill will probably be fine. Uh, my, it's difficult for me because I'm a purist. My aesthetic is that I want stuff to 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 be designed in a way that you will enjoy it fairly immediately, mm. um, or at least when you see it for the first time, or at least the yeah. second or third time. I don't want people to wait five or six years until it works. Uh, I want people to enjoy that, you know, that that aesthetic, that piece of music, or that piece of writing. You know, when when they absorb it for the first or second time, that's quite important to me. Um, I also believe if it does happen that way, it will it will stand the test of time. Yeah. Yes, it will be of an era, like I've said before. It will be of a time, um, but it it still won't great with you. It'll still be enjoyable. And aesthetics to me is is a, is a point of joy, the way that anything creative should be. You know, whether a piece of art or or or, 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 or music, um, it's about. It's about enjoying something. And somebody said, what's your, you know, what's your uh, objective? Uh, what's your metric, as he used to say in the business, for measuring your cars? Oh, God, I hated that. <laughs> what's your metric? <laughs> well, my metric is 17. What does that mean exactly? What does that mean? You know, <laughs> it's 17 out of 17, right? And it's just, for a designer, it's just a nonsense. Yeah. Um, but my metric I used to tell people is that when somebody buys something that I've been involved with um, they, and they get home from work and they park the car up on the driveway if they're lucky to have one and they turn around and look at it and smile, then I have one. That's it. Yeah. I'm happy. Because it gives them a joy. If they just get into the house and, you know, and get on with the rest of their day, then, then the car becomes sort of a, a nothingness in their life then. That yeah. designer has failed in my my eyes, and it doesn't matter how exotic or modest the car is. It it matters every time to me. That matters, and 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 people say to me, um, "Well, why should it matter? Does it really matter what car looks like?" Yes. Well, <laughs> no, probably not. Does it matter what anything looks like? Does it matter what your clothes that you wear look like? 
you know, you've got to, you know, and if it doesn't matter to you, then fine. But I think if if a human being, if if, if someone's going to create something, do the best job possible. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really cost much more. It might cost a bit more if we're exotic with the materials that we would make make a car, but do the best possible job possible. And that has always been my 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 approach. And yeah. it will matter to somebody, you know, not everybody. And I think sort of if I look back at at least my lifetime, cheaper cars seem to, to some extent, have less sort of interesting design. But we're, I feel like that's changed a lot over time. And actually now some of the most interesting design I think is in that space, which particularly around EVs, is the sort of lower end of the segments and, and companies like whether it's like Peugeot or Hyundai or, you know, all these companies, Kia, coming out with stuff that you go, oh, hang on a minute. And then you've, you've got BMW over here who've designed something that might look better in the future, unknown. Um, and then all these really sort of great shapes and designs coming out. I, I think it's I think it's awesome because it's previously it kind of used to be in the more exotic stuff. It, it did, I think, because companies tend to give more exotic stuff a bit more time and, and, and effort. But um, I've always been a great lover of smaller cars, not necessarily cheaper cars, but but they do tend to run hand in hand, yeah. price and size, which is always unfortunate because I always wanted to do a small Jaguar. And they yes. said, well, we can't get down to a price band that, that we can afford to build. I said, well, do a small Jaguar that's an expensive one. But nobody could buy into that. It wasn't going to happen. So, which I actually disagree with. I, I don't think size matters in that respect. I think I think you so. create a smaller object that people will buy because it's small. I spoke to so many, particularly women, who were of a certain social standing when I went to various, um, you know, events and parties, and they said, "Well, why don't you do a baby Jaguar?" I said, "Well, because the the price point will be too low for us to be able to build it." Oh, I don't care what I pay for it. Yeah. You know, if it, if the car's right, but it's small enough to drive around London, they will buy it, but they want the luxuries and the features and everything else. So I still hold that point that small luxury still has a place in the world. However, um, no, you're right. Small cars are finding a stronger place in the world, um, but it's all relative. Small ca- small cars are still too big, in my view. Yes, they're cars not small. <laughs> uh, cars, are, cars are basically all too big. They should be smaller, but... There are certain aspects of the cars which dictate their size, not least of all the fact that people are getting bigger. And and legislation and safety de- demands a lot of them now that, that perhaps 20, 30 years ago just wasn't there. But you're right. I think there's more attention being made to these small cars. And also the design teams in these companies are getting stronger and stronger. Mm. You know, people always assume that the best designers are, are in Jaguar, Aston Martin, and Ferrari, you know, Lamborghini, because these are the exotic car companies to work for. It's not the case. It really is not the case. Some of the best designers are actually in companies like Volvo. You know, yeah. I like to think JLR as well, but uh, I'll let somebody else make that opinion. Yeah. They're certainly not not necessarily in in the exotic car world. No, and I I love it when I come across a new a, a new vehicle, a new experience of a vehicle, and I I'm looking around the cabin or something, and there's something that's like a di- bit different and neat. And like a neat solution that I've not seen before. And you're like, oh, why does no one else do that? And I've only found it in this car, which is must seem obvious after the fact, but there'll be a reason why you don't just come up with these things. Yeah, most good designers like that. You know, somebody thinks of it and says, well, let's... And I used to say to my team, let's just think up some crazy ideas. You know, mm. and if you think up a 50, maybe one of them will come to fruition. And, you know, think off the wall. And... It sometimes works. You, you you come up with something which which nobody else has, uh, and it, it, they may be fairly gratuitous ideas, but it just adds a bit of s- sparkle to the interior of the vehicle, uh, yeah. emotion emotional sparkle. I mean, yeah. in your sort of period of designing, the technology for making cars has changed a lot, and the tools for design and stuff like that. Has that really shifted? What you can design and how you sort of almost how you think about design, I guess, because the manufacturing will have changed a bit and then give you more scope or do you sort of go for it and then work it out? Yeah. The the, the process, 
The process of designing a car now, I mean, I started back in the 70s and, you know, the, the Mark III Escort was, was about to come out. So the car I was familiar with at the time in the road was the Mark II Escort. I mean, if you look at Mark II, II Escort, uh, and people are paying lots of money for them now, by the way, but um, or a Mark I, they're incredibly simple objects. Yeah. They really are. They're a, a kind of a, a box with, you know, leaf springs stuck at the back of <laughs> it. Um, a motor car now is hugely complex, hugely complex in so many aspects, in the way it's put together, the electronics of it. I mean, you know, 40% of the development of a new motor car is electronics. Wow. You know, when I started, it was about 4%. <laughs> okay, so it's yeah. multiplied by 10. Um, well, the rest of it has probably stayed in terms of manpower about the same, uh, but they're doing a lot more with the tools they have to get to the solutions they need to get to. And um, they're hugely complex items. Now, in order to be able to cope with that complexity and that number of components, if you sit in the interior of a car and look at the number of components that are there, it's phenomenal. You know, and the way the seats are built, they've got 16-way controls in some cars. They've got every feature under the sun. And, and, and so it goes on and on and on. And you need the tools now. You need the opportunity to, to design and engineer things much quicker to get through that that mass of work yeah. that 20, 30 years ago would have taken 10 years to do, you know, just for a simple motor car. And the other thing that amazes me is people look at motor cars now, almost some of them as commodities. These are the ones that really don't care what they look like, but um, just to get from A to B, they have no idea of how complicated that vehicle is underneath. And the amount of work that's gone into developing it is phenomenal. Just the way it goes around a corner, you know, the, the understanding of the geometry, how that car is on a corner so it doesn't do odd things. 15 years ago, you accepted 20 years ago that a car would start to spin sideways, you know, on a slightly damp road. But nowadays that's unacceptable. So the technology of what that car is doing to stop that happening is phenomenal. And I think anybody learning to drive today in a modern car is well protected from reality of the dynamism of that vehicle and what it can do. Yeah. Well protected. You know, I learned to drive in a, in, in a Mini, the original Mini. I mean, that was a very capable vehicle. Talking of small cars and yeah. cheap cars, that was very capable. But my goodness, you had to be at your wits, you know, <laughs> your wits and, and on, on, you know, full power in order to drive that car at any reasonable speed or even a yeah. Ford Anglia. You know, so the amount, the complexity about a, of a motor car, from a design, engineering, uh, understanding point of view, is just phenomenal, and probably more complex. And I'd say, just about anything in the world, maybe bar uh, a fighter jet. Yeah. So you know, that's hugely complex for obvious reasons, but but uh, it's um it, it's 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 an incredible accomplishment to build and design any motor car now. Yeah. Of course, the problem now is it's all changing. You know, we spent 100 years getting to where we are now, and we have to <laughs> set, take a step back and think, oh, my goodness, what do we do now? We're going to have to change all this. People say, well, why don't people just build electric cars? Well, it's not that simple. It, you know, there are, there are factories out there built. There, there's factories designed to build a million cars of one type, one, one, one yeah. line, one, not just a brand, but a line, a million cars a year. And suddenly you're going to say, well, we're not going to build them that way anymore. We're going to build them with electric platforms and this and this and this. I mean, it's mind blowing the change that the car industry is going to have to go through and is going through. And I saw evidence of this when I was at Jaguar. You know, the the angst of what you know, you got a billion pounds to spend. Where do you put it? Yeah. You know, and, you know. Some people say, "Well, we need another V8 engine." Well, the last thing you want to do now is design a new V8 engine. They probably only got a five year lifespan. Yeah. You know, and it's going to cost you three quarters of a billion to design. So. It's 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 interesting times, as I say, for the car industry. Was that quite interesting when you were doing the I-Pace, which was one of the very early sort of mm. electric cars that was then adopted? You're heavily involved in all of that process. Yeah, what was it like at that time going, trying to handle that change? Well, I, it, was, it was fantastic. I, I was loving it because I could see opportunity here to do and do something quite different. You know, and really, really turn the status quo on its head. You know, mm. an engine at the front and luggage at the back and people in the middle and all that stuff. Well, we had this platform. We could put anything anywhere, really. We had crash requirements, of course. So it still has to have a bonnet of some kind. 
but um you know to absorb any impact but on, on the whole we could move people around easier there was nothing predetermining where where the package of this car should be above the wheel axle yeah We'd never been given that opportunity before so <laughs> it ended up in a quite i think quite a different shape really it, yeah. it's probably as, as different as cars are ever going to get frankly but um it was a great time but on the other hand the process of developing a, a platform, an electric platform, and the manufacturing side of it was hugely complicated and, mm. and hugely expensive and it caused a lot of trials and tribulations amongst the, 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 the top management because they were saying, well, do we, can we really afford to do this? And my argument was you can't afford not to do it. Yeah. You, know, you had to do it. This was just the start of a whole new journey, so get into it now learn from it. And I have to tell you, when we're doing the F-Pace, it was never at the forefront of anybody's mind within the business. It was just a, always, it was just a half, we have to do this in addition. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think if we were to do it now, it'd be the top of the list and not somewhere near the bottom. Somewhere at the bottom, yeah. That's... In fact, it was near the bottom of the list, allowed the design team a lot more freedom because people weren't taking a huge amount of notice of it being developed, Yeah, which was wonderful. The next, the sort of, the next stage of, e, I guess, EVs, but also mobility. Where do you see this going moving forward? Was, I, I know it's, it's quite an expansive topic, but going from small cars to now there's plenty of other things that are available that are even smaller. Yeah, I think the, the use of multi, multiple use of cars, you know, one car using, being used by a number of people as in a taxi mode, but autonomous mode is, is going to become more commonplace in which case the car's aesthetic becomes more about good design and 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 um, a good aesthetic to have in the road rather than a very personal one mm. however i don't think people will give up motor car as a personal object for quite a number of years yet whether it be electric or autonomous or whatever uh, i think people will always want to have that that object in the driveway even if they use it less and um maybe their purchasing process might be different. Maybe it'll be leased more often and they'll change them every six months or whatever. But I think people will still want a personal mode of transport in the driveway for quite a time to go. Um, however, things are changing. And the answer to that is I don't really know. I don't know. A lot of younger people don't even want to learn to drive. So, you know, in 20, 30 years time, the car may become um, less of a, a requirement. Uh, yeah. And public and it, transport will become the more obvious means of transportation. Public transport, which I'm a great believer in, has to get better. Yeah. You know, I do use public transport, but it's simply not good enough. That's it. And you go to places that have it, – it, it gets down to sort of town planning, doesn't it? That's kind of the, the yeah. key part, and then the rest of it fits in or doesn't fit in. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I, I won't get political here, but there should be governmental policy on – all public transportation around the country that that works for people mm. um you know i think people get made to be i think nowadays and today's right is as is, is much of the right as people having education or, or food on the table um so it needs it needs to get better but the motor car will prevail it will <laughs> people like you and me will still want to get into their indulgence and enjoy the weekend in them exactly exactly so with callum designs You've you've delved into quite a few different different projects. What have been some of the more or your your sort of personal favourites or particularly interesting ones? Well, we've done yeah. And this was getting back to my original notion that I'm a designer rather than just a car designer. And mm. and the funny thing is, if you're a designer, you want to prove it to yourself. You're more interested in proving it to yourself than anybody else, frankly. Um, if other people take note of it and are are complimentary, then great, that's a bonus. But it's your own belief and self-beliefs that matter we've done some furniture we've done a chair we're going to do another chair soon uh you know we're actually having those built uh, we're actually doing coal boxes at the moment believe it or not i mean it may seem like a small commodity but quite a fascinating subject yeah um we've done some electric scooters and motorbikes we will be doing a couple of supercars for customers but that's getting back to the car world yeah we did the dakar car for um pro drive which you you may know about the yeah, that yeah, yeah. Easter yeah. thing um, called the Hunter. Um, that was good fun. 
Uh, and we're doing various things. Oh, we've even, we even done our own whiskey, you might have noticed. But uh, I saw that, yeah. It's uh, that a passion project. or Yeah, that was just a bit of a passion project. And, and, and done with a friend of mine I was at school with who owns the distillery. So just happens to own a distillery, you know, as they do. What were, like with, with the whiskey, what was the sort of, you know, what was the question at the start? <laughs> well, the question was, um, Ian, I have a distillery. Would you like to do a, would you like to have a barrel of one of, of my, whiskey will pick the best and it was an offering rather than an objective and yeah. i said yeah he says well you design the bottle and we'll supply the whiskey so it was as simple as that but yeah, we did yeah, pick yeah. the barrel it's a unique barrel um and uh we've created the 250 bottles of it mm. but it, was, it, was, it was an opportunity to create a, bit, a whiskey bottle really did you um did you do something with the british bobsleigh team Oh, yeah, we thing. took they they were they were um, asking for a bit of help with just minor stuff really. We didn't we didn't design their whole capsule, so to speak, the bobsleigh. We took the one we had, which was a bit tired, and we rebuilt it and we redesigned the detailing on it. So it was a bit more ergonomic and also right. just a bit more beautiful to look at. So, you know, when they're up there and they're on the on the track with all these uh, other wealthier teams, then uh, they would feel as if they were they were the part of the the same uh, the same level. So we did some detailing work and we did the graphics as well, which was a bit of fun. And on, on something like that, that probably for most people looks like kind of a simple thing. I imagine the ergonomics and stuff like that is actually incredibly important in terms of actual performance because it's got to work and they've got to be able to use it. Well, we had to discover how they made it work. I mean, you know, we went through the videos with them. We didn't actually physically do it ourselves because it wasn't, it wasn't practical, but, um, it's it's a pretty demanding process to go through, and we immediately saw areas where they could they were hurting themselves on some yeah. things. So we saw areas where we could make improvement just by a bit of application, you know, and the fact we could do it, and a bit of common sense, but more about application. So mm. yeah, that, jumping on a bobsleigh at that speed and staying there is very complicated, <laughs> and not something I would want to do. Yeah, but we were brave people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a lot of your designs, to me, look look very complete and kind of organic and like nicely rounded off. You see, or you, I hear of um, designers and heads of design having to sort of fight with other parts of their company, etc., to sort of maintain that vision. Is that is that quite difficult to do? Or I imagine it depends on where you're working, but. No, it is very difficult to do because the inputs you get are fairly adamant, you know, and somebody will say if they're designing, let's just call it a five series, you know, the headroom has to be this dimension. Yeah. The, the boot space has to be this dimension. The bonnet has to be here for pedestrian safety. And so the silhouette is, is pretty well predetermined mm. by a set of inputs and objectives from other areas. What we did at Jaguar was challenge those. And I said, you know, do you really need 75.2 millimeters of headroom? Can we not make yeah. it 70? Oh, well, well, we'll lose a number of sales of cars if we do that. Nonsense. We'll make it better looking, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, and I remember a BMW designer coming to see me and said, we love the way you get the silhouette of your car. It's just looking a little bit more streamlined than ours. I said, well, the, you know, he told me, he said, we get given the overall dimensions to work to. I said, well, we challenge every one of them. You know, because the aesthetic to a Jaguar is, is so important. And that's, yeah. so the answer is yes, it's hugely difficult. It's hugely difficult convincing a, 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 a group of 200, you know, and analysts and, and um, objective setters that the numbers are not necessarily the right numbers. And you have yeah. to challenge them. I remember we doing the F type, the bonnet would have been about 20 inch, 20 millimeters taller. Than right. it is, and it ended up if we hadn't gone back and challenged the components under the bonnet. And so what you do is you go and learn about them and, and you take it head on and you challenge it. Because if the bonnet had been 20 millimetres higher, the, the seat height would have to have been 20 millimetres higher. So the roof would have been 20 millimetres yeah. higher. You know, and it has a knock-on effect. And we weren't going to do that. So, you know, and I, yeah, I could have my strops. I could, you know, <laughs> throw my toys out the pram and say, well, I'm not doing it then, you know. Well, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't quite that extreme, but people wonder why we got so sort of feisty. And it's because it mattered to us. Yeah, This car looked beautiful. And so you have to go back and negotiate the movement of bits and pieces that people don't want to move, including occupants, by the way, including yeah. people. 
You know, when we design a car for something that's six foot three, well, okay, tell them to get a Land Rover, Range Rover. <laughs> exactly. It's not exactly. for them. And you have to, that's the point I was saying earlier. You have to find that balance of what really matters. So, yes, you're constantly battling with inputs and, and where to get. And every designer does, you know, because their their prime ob- objective is something which is aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. And then over time with more components going into cars and more regulations and whatever, like, is it much harder now to to design something that just looks good than yes, you know, it's much fifteen harder. years ago? It gets harder all the time, and you can't argue against safety. If you know if it saves one life, then you, then then there's something you you have to accept graciously. Um, but there's some regulations perhaps are a little bit over the top and maybe not necessary. Uh, and you can go back and maybe challenge them, but then you have to go through a court of law to change them. So you don't usually win that one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But no, it's becoming more difficult. And therefore, the idea of uh, creativity and imagination becomes even more important. Mm. You know, people rave about all the, 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 the concept cars the Italians used to do in the 60s and 50s. <laughs> you know, all these lovely concept cars that the Carrozzeria of Italy used to build. Yeah. Why can't we do cars like that? Because none of them would meet any of the regulations now. <laughs> no one near it. You know, um, an E type wouldn't meet most of the regulations now. So you're, you're dealing with a completely new set of rules. And as you say, they're changing. They're changing annually. And also, you've got the American set of rules, the federal, as we call it, um, for crash requirements. And you've got the European, these are the two main ones, the European and mm. I wish, just wish they'd speak to each other and just get one set of rules because. Yeah. You actually have to design something which, in some way, conflicts the other. And some design engineer, uh, some European car companies, of course, produce cars which are only for sale in in European-based yeah. countries, such as some of the many of the French cars, for instance. And um, you don't have to worry about the American regulations, which are really just as stringent, but they're different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it gets. Imagine you see it in the sort of the top end of the market, or actually, oh yeah, all the way through. You see cars that people in another part of the world, or we we look at them and go, "Why can't I have that?" And they go, "Why can't we have that? Why can't we have this?" You know, in America, maybe we can't have this small hatchback type thing. And they're like, "Well, it won't sell." And you're like, "Maybe it would." Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, um, the other thing is interesting is the Ford Focus went into the US. I remember when they decided to design it. The Ford Focus was, of course, created in Europe, <clears throat> in in England and Germany jointly and um a very very wonderful a wonderful car and then they brought it into the u.s as a kind of little baby car that you give your 16 year old daughter which yeah. passes their test and they suddenly said well we can't build this car here because it's too expensive because in europe ford focus was a family car yeah in america it was you know it was a kmart <laughs> car so to speak. and so the yeah. two were in complete conflict and it was overly engineered for for an american type of yeah cheap car and so suddenly ford found that building world cars wasn't actually that straightforward yeah because the markets are different yeah they definitely are and they're they're changing very much all the time Hmm. in your own cars what do you um do you do you have a few of the ones you've designed or (laughs) that's probably probably get that question all the time uh, um only one and that's the aston martin vanquish Mm. Um, which I'm selling, by the way, because uh, um, I'm having to reduce my my stable of cars a little bit. Yeah, because they all become too complicated. My but, um, yeah, I've got a Vanquish. Yeah. My first experience in a sports supercar type thing was a Vanquish, actually, and mm. it was. And I think it, we came went to Aston Martin and got I got taken around this sort of test track. And uh, that that stuck with me forever. And I was like, oh, this is such a cool looking car, um, which I know you've revisited. Are you still, how many of the, is it, what's it called? Vanquish by Callum? Is that what it's yeah, called? Yeah, we call it the VC25. Um, it feels so long ago now because, you know, I've, I've we're building them. Um, yeah. But I'm not involved in any of the development yeah. work. It's done. Yeah, we've built a few. Uh, I'm not sure how many. We've built a few. We're building a few more. Uh, over the next, probably the next two or three years, actually. Um, it's quite a demanding project because it is lasting a long time. To, you know, you, to, to take a car apart and rebuild it is not something you do 
yeah. in a month. It takes quite a while. And then during COVID, we had real issues with it in terms of supply of parts and things. So, you know, we, we stalled for a while, but uh, yeah. we're, we're back on track again. And yeah, and your, what are you sort of, uh, do you have an old 911? I do, yes. Yes, I have a 993, the best one. Yeah. <laughs> um, what led you to 993? Well, two two reasons. It was I love air cool. I grew up with Beatles as well as Minis. Yeah, I think they were the standard format for anybody growing up in the seventies. But um, uh, I love air cooled engines, flat engines. I don't know something about them which I find very appealing. Mm. Especially when you have to fix them, you don't have to worry about all the water hoses. Yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, I just love the flat fours and flat sixes of uh, air cooled engines. So nine nine three was the last one, uh, last air cooled nine eleven. And Tony Hatter, my good friend, um, designer, designed the body for it. Um, so that was another another point of of, of interest. And um, I just think it's the best looking one. It's a beautiful car. Yeah. Have you got an RS or is it? No, it's a modified 983. It's been heavily modified uh, like an RS. Um, and it's, you know, it's a 3.8. It was done by Rook Engineering in Germany. Before I got it, I bought it. Mm, okay, yeah. I bought it in that that way. So it's a lovely car. It, it's been stripped out. It's you know pseudo lightweight. It's got carbon yeah. seats and and such like. And quite raw. It's quite raw, yeah. So when I want to go out for a, a real seat of the pants drive, that's why. Although I have to, I've driven it distances. I've driven it to Scotland and back. It's fine, you know. Mm. So uh, it's it's quite uh, quite civilized. It has a radio. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have to have some sort of music or something yeah, in, too. in yeah. all my cars. So I love my 911s, yeah. Um, and I've got a few other old things, which, uh, you know, I'm constantly having to either have someone fix for me or fix myself. Do you quite enjoy working on them? Yeah, when it works. <laughs> yeah. I have moments when they don't work and I, my, I tell you my knuckles are bleeding and you know, and I can't get the certain thread off, and you know, I'll almost start swearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do enjoy working for them as long working on them as long as I don't rely on it, which is often the case. Anyway, I can always just walk away and leave it for a couple of days. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I would love to rebuild a couple just to get them back to a state of perfection, but I don't think I'll have time for that. Mm. What sort of things in the I say design world? We could be automotive. Pique your interest at the moment. What are you sort of looking at and going, oh, that's that's quite an interesting segment or I'd like to see something um, like that? Well, unlike a lot of people, I don't, I don't have a huge fascination for watches, funnily enough. A lot of people ask me that. I do like mm. watches. When I see one which I like, I will notice, notice it. I don't get drawn into branding of anything, funnily enough. Um, um, also, I keep very close eye in the car world. There are often cars out there people talk about that I don't even know about, which I've obviously lost track on. Uh, architecture, I, I like looking at modern architecture and mm. architectural ideas using different materials and things. And I suppose that's, in, in my mind, is something I'm gearing up perhaps to doing something in the future. I'd like to do another house for myself if I found the right plot. But um, yeah, uh, furniture, I enjoy looking at furniture design, seeing how that develops. I look at product design uh, uh, sites. Um, it was the uh, the furniture ones and I was sitting in my dad's living room at the weekend and he's got some chairs that we were just sort of discussing what well, he actually wasn't in the room but me and my wife were discussing like what works and as you're saying about the design of cars it, certain things are of the era that mm. they were designed in but are like a, the great example of that era whereas you sometimes get sort of almost like a copy but it wasn't the great design and then immediately it 10 years later 20 years later it looks dated because it just kind of wasn't it wasn't even right when it was conceptualized that that's often the case yeah you can see that in a lot of design work it was as i always say it was wrong then and it's wrong now it doesn't <laughs> yeah. take much you know you can look at a lot of mid-century stuff which is becoming very popular because it's 70 years old now and um, you look at a lot of mid-century stuff, and um, a lot of it was very beautiful. Even Bauhaus. I'm a great Bauhaus fan, you know, mm. got a vastly chair. got two, actually. Um, you know, I love the, the simplicity of engineering and style that comes together with Bauhaus in a very yeah. minimalist, almost brutal way sometimes. 
Um, but a lot of the fifties stuff, if you look at it, um, uh, you know, especially in architecture, a lot of it was rubbish. It really was poor. <laughs> a lot of it was great, you know. And concrete brutalism obviously became very popular for a while in the sixties, and some of it worked, but a lot of it still looks brutal and not not yeah. nice. And people will stand by it and say, "Yeah, but it was of an era, and therefore it has a value." Yeah, maybe, but if it didn't look good then, it still doesn't look good now. I don't get, I don't see what the value is. There's a certain shopping center which I won't mention, but which was designed in the fifties, which I became familiar with, and um, you know, I'd advocated that they knock the place down and rebuild something of of today's idiom and and yeah. some really beautiful modern design and let that last a hundred years. Yeah. But you know the processes are up in arms about oh, you have to protect it. It was designed in 1955, and I said it looks rubbish. I could use two stronger words, but um, you know it looks weak. It looks fragile. It's not nice. You know yeah. it's built to a cost. You can tell. So knock it down. But oh, yeah. no. I and think I, it has a preservation order on it now. It's it's such a shame with that sort of stuff because, like you said about whether it's a car or whatever, it's got to give you a good feeling when you look at it or mm. use it and we have so many things that are a bit like that that are sort of you know mandated that they must be around and you're like yeah but when they were designed they weren't designed to be around for a thousand years they no. were just like no, no, they no. were just done I know. I know um so i normally wrap these up with five questions are you ready yeah yeah what what's your most memorable driving trip or journey Wow, I've been so lucky. You know, I've done the Millamilia three times, you know, and, and some fairly demanding cars, including a D-Type, a Curie cost D-Type, which was phenomenal. And that's four days of pretty rig. Anyway, put that to one side. The most memorable journey was driving a 250 shot wheelbase Ferrari that belonged to a friend of mine. And it was a Rob Walker one, number seven. Oh, yes. And blue with a white stripe, with a white stripe on it. Yeah, that one. And I drove it up the west coast of Scotland through a road that I grew up with as a child. I used to go on holiday there through Ullapool and then further up the west coast. And if you've never been there, I advise you drive it because it's the most wonderful road in the world. And and you can see for miles. Yeah. So you can really plan your actions, you know? Yeah. And um, I took it up there and we did two days of driving with the Ferrari up there. All hell that was. It was brilliant. <laughs> That and must I'll never forget it. It's just a, the biggest take in any bucket list you could possibly wish for. Yeah, that that must have been mega. One of my best or most sort of memorable drives was a, was a twenty minutes in a GTO engineering short wheelbase mm. revival type thing, um, and that that for me didn't have any of the you know the, those associations or anything of the right place or whatever. But for thirty minutes. I drove it and I pulled over on the side of the road and was like, okay, I need to have like a sit down. This is just too much like awesomeness. It, it's awesome is the right word. It's a phenomenal car to drive and it just plays with you as well. That's what I loved about it. You know, it, it just eased you in and, and you know, it wasn't, uh, and you had to drive it. It was a lovely car. Yeah. Lovely car. Rev it. That's it. Rev it. <laughs> 10,000 easily. <laughs> yeah. Doing the, um, the Millimigia, um that that looks intense like oh. is it fun at the time or is it one of those things that you're like oh that was awesome to do it's grueling <laughs> it's honestly grueling you know you you get through, especially if it starts to rain of course the three cars i did it was a 120 a c type and a d type the three times nice. what's the Leno actually um, nice. that was hilarious because he just kept telling me jokes for four days um <laughs> but uh no it's grueling and, you know, you take off at six in the morning or seven and you don't get back in till about 12 or one o'clock, the, the, you know, one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You're lucky if you can get a beer down you. You're off to bed and you're back up again at five and you're knackered. Yeah. No, no, it's not, unless you're in a closed car. I think if you're in a closed car, it's a bit more fun. But in an open car, it's it's hard work. And I think a lot of, we brought a lot of celebrities with us with Jaguar on them. I think mm. they found it quite tough going. <laughs> Did you sort of pre-vet them for how much of a you think they were really going to be into it beforehand? I, I kind of had my point of view of who was going to last, who wasn't. But I'll tell you a great participant who always was with us and a good friend of mine is David Gandhi. Mm. And David was with us in our Jags. And um, uh, 
he was always great fun. He took it took it right in the chin. He could drive actually, and you know there was no uh, there was no uh, celebrity lovey stuff about him. He was full yeah. on, you know. <laughs> so uh, he was good. But some of them I kind of looked at the beginning and thought, mm, I'm not sure they're going to make it. Yeah, yeah. But most of <laughs> them did. Most of them did. To be fair, yeah. But I think some of them were expecting champagne and canopies most of the way. Yeah, with the the D type, does that have synchros? Were you sharing the driving? Yeah, sharing the driving. Was the D-Type synchro? No, I don't think so, no. Oh, Was yeah, third, third and fourth, I think it's synchro. Yeah. It's the second, I don't think it did, no. So you have to give some of the passengers a bit we of a lesson. A soft, we put a softer clutch on it. Okay. Just yeah. to make things a little easier. Um, if you could only drive one car for the rest of your life, mm. I'm say sports car, what, what, what would it be? Oh my goodness, I should say F type Jaguar, shouldn't I? Don't have to. <laughs> um I think it'd be a, a 993 Porsche. Mm. You know, or a nine nine three Porsche, maybe a turbo. Yeah. You know, just kind of um uh and and, and and an old one as well, because I I love the tactility of these older cars. The nine nine two is a lovely car, and nine nine one's a lovely car, and I've driven them both. Um but like the F type, you know, they are they, they they do a lot of the work for you, uh, yeah. whereas a nine nine three is still old enough to you have to work at it. So it had to be a nine nine three. Yeah, it's it, as I go back and drive more older Porsches, I sort of get a little taste of each era, and I can I'm totally becoming that person that's like I could see how you might have, you know, a nine nine two. I've got a nine nine seven. Then you might have a nine six four. You know, like because they're all sort of different ish. They are, they are, and I've driven a few of them. Um, but my other everyday car at the moment is a Volkswagen T6 van. Oh, nice. So yeah. perhaps that, that, if I was allowed another car, I would have that as my everyday driver. Yeah. Then then you've got your fun and then, and then your all the practicality you need. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? What should be worth more? Um, probably older. Older Jaguars. Do you know what? Probably a DB7, if I can mention it. Mm. There's a lot of good car in the DB7. I know a lot of people know the history of it, and there's a lot of Jag stuff in it, but as a car to drive, it's a lot of fun to drive. And, you know, you can pick them up for about thirteen, fifteen thousand pounds 15000 Yeah. I think they really should be worth more than that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think they should be up in the 30s at least for good ones. But, but uh, yeah, I think that's a hugely undervalued car because when people drive them, they don't expect to drive as well as they do. Mm, and they look yeah. great. Yeah. I think and they look one. nice, you know, they always get a bit of attention. And it's an Aston. <laughs> exactly. It's an <laughs> Aston Martin. Um, what's the most interesting car to you at the moment? Are you looking up anything, Googling? Um, oh, my goodness, that's a difficult one. I'm I, Overall, I'm keeping an eye on how the EVs are developing, yeah. like, generalising a bit. I think what Audi and Volkswagen are doing are quite interesting because they're going all out. Volkswagen made a commitment to go all out. I'm not sure what JLR are doing in the electric car front because I'm not party to it anymore. Yeah. We had already decided Jaguar would be an electric car company before I left, so I wasn't I wasn't sure why this was all suddenly new news. But um, um, on the electric car front, I think uh, I'm fascinated in how Volkswagen and, and Audi and Porsche and how Porsche have – embraced it in the way they did Porsche of all companies I think is fantastic yeah um, so uh, you know I love the, the Taycan I think is a supercar uh, but how Volkswagen are dealing with it and dealing with a way which has got to be manageable and affordable is going to be quite fascinating to watch yeah you can get some of it out of volume I understand that but the, the, the price of batteries and such like uh, it's difficult it's a difficult thing to do it is. It does feel like the cheap-ish. The cheaper, cheap yeah, and there are those as well. You know? Yeah, there are those as well. But but they're doing it. They're doing it well. Um, and then when you get into the Audi range, I think some of those cars are really quite uh, quite stunning. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the sort of Gen Two, but I, we might not even even see that with. The, all the software and stuff. It seems like like Taycan got uh, an update, any Taycan, yeah. and they got ten percent more range. And you're like, yeah. oh, if yeah. we can get incremental little changes, five percent, ten percent every year. 
And that's what's to keep an eye on because people are quite cynical. Some people are cynical about, well, the range of this. And also included in all that, of course, is the battery technology. You know, I'm a great believer that the technology will save us in the mess we're in. And, um, of course, one of the immediate issues is battery and battery technology. And I think that will develop tremendously over the next five years, not just in its ability, but also the content as well. Yeah. That sounds like one of the big developments will be, yeah, yeah. what they're made of and chemistry. And hydrogen. Watch that one, hydrogen. I'm, I'm looking a lot into hydrogen at the moment at work, and we're, we're developing some stuff with a couple of hydrogen people, and, and hydrogen has its place as well. So it's a different it's, entity, but it's certainly got a place. I was listening to a podcast yesterday about hydrogen and some of the interesting sort of science parts of it, and it sounds, it sounds complicated, it's complicated, but, you know, it starts off complicated. It always does. Um, but it's an alternative. And the future is not going to be one mode of, of power source, no. you know, and it's going to be a numerous modes of power source and and uh, we'll find different ways. And the right the right one for the right application. Yes. That's it. Like, yeah. Um, for final question, five-car garage, unlimited value. Five-car garage. Hmm. Um, okay, uh, F-Type SVR, although they don't do it anymore, sadly, but imagine That's they did. Right. Um, um, Porsche 993, mm. a 32 hot rod. Nice. Which I have. Um, classic Mini. Okay. Possibly a Mark II Mini Cooper S, which I used to own, don't anymore. And finally, um, Volkswagen T6. You wouldn't, wouldn't have it. and Lord. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Good, thank you. I hope you enjoyed some of the answers. And yeah, it was good. good to speak to you. It was, it was great to chat. And if, if I see you at an event somewhere, somewhere, I will come and say hello. Thank you, Sam.